The kind of system that gave Darwin nightmares and thinking about how his theory might be wrong because animals were too nice to each other involves social insects. And social insects often have a social system that we refer to as eusociality. This is where you have cooperative brood care, so you have all these individuals looking after the, the pupa or the larva. And you have reproductive castes, so you have a queen versus a lot of workers. And then you also have overlapping generations, so the workers may live, die, and be replaced by yet more workers. Now, truly social insects, these eusocial insects, all of the ants are eusocial. Many bees and wasps are social eusocial, as are termites and a few other insects like aphids and beetles. So let's look at some examples. Leafcutter ants have a wonderful social system where you have workers who go out and use very specialized pincers to cut segments of leaf. Then others carry those sections of leaf back to the nest and there's a sentry who guards it to prevent others from Tacking, tagging along or stealing the leaf. They take it back to the nest and they put it into a fungus garden. So below ground they cultivate fungus which can digest the cellulose in the leaf and the ants thrive literally on a diet of mushrooms down below. So an extraordinary division of labor with sentries and workers and cutters all at the service of a queen somewhere. Army ants, another amazing example. So you have these really fierce mandibles that are ready to protect the nest against invaders and they're standing guard over the other workers for bringing food back and they also will help sometimes to capture very very large prey. They cannot reproduce themselves. They have a very specialized role within the society. Look at these. These are giant Japanese hornets. These are the largest wasps and they're extraordinary predators of honeybees. Now, they're a solitary predator, and a Japanese hornet can kill up to 100 honeybees in a single day. Now, the honeybees don't like this, but bees are so incredibly cooperative and so incredibly altruistic that you'll get swarms of honeybees if they find one of these killer wasps. They'll engulf it, and then they all buzz their wings, raising the metabolism, heating up to where they essentially cook the hornet and kill it. But in so doing, of course, they cook themselves. So they have this extraordinary self-sacrificial behavior to protect their hive and their fellow workers from these invaders. So remember when we looked at sex determination systems in the last lecture that the social insects, the wasps and bees and some of these aphids have this very peculiar reproductive system and sex determination by haplodiploid. Females are diploid and the males are haploid. Now we're ready to look at this in much more detail. Honeybees are eusocial and they're haplodiploid. You have within this thriving hive, you have workers who have this hygienic behavior. They feed the eggs and the pupa. They are hygienic in removing sick pupae, uncapping the things. They've got all kinds of tasks that they do at the hive. They go out, they collect the pollen, they do all the work. Now they're all females. Workers are diploid and they're female. And they do this on behalf of a queen. The queen is also diploid. These workers are her daughters. Now also within the hive there are a few somewhat larger individuals that don't do much. They're not helping the keep the nest clean, they're not going out and collecting pollen, but they're getting ready to go off somewhere else and to spread genetic material by mating with queens and other nests. These are the drones and they're male and they're haploid. They are the result of a virgin birth literally in that they are unfertilized eggs that develop nevertheless and they grow up to be males. So. Within the hive, the important thing, getting back to Darwin's puzzle, is here are all these workers. They're doing all this. They're sweating it out all the time on behalf of the queen, and they never reproduce on their own. They're sterile workers, but they're all female. Now, let's look at these castes and how it relates to haplodiploidy. 
we have an unrelated drone who mates with a queen, okay? And the queen literally is just the egg factory. So she's pumping out what will become more workers and more drones and more queens. So the male is haploid, and every one of his sperm are going to be genetically identical. He's got haploid sperm. They're literally clones of his body cells. The queen is diploid. So she produces haploid eggs, and if she chooses to fertilize her eggs with the sperm that she has stored inside her reproductive tract, those eggs will be fertilized, and they mostly then grow up to be workers. Generation after generation, she's producing more and more workers. They're all diploids, they're all sterile, they're all females. Okay? If she chooses not to fertilize some of her eggs, she lays unfertilized eggs, those will grow up to be drones, they're haploid, and they'll go off and repeat the whole cycle somewhere else. At some point, the female starts producing diploid eggs that are going to be growing up to become new queens. So she does have some reproductive daughters. Besides all of these sterile daughters, a small proportion of daughters will likewise be reproductives. They'll be new queens. The workers help them to disperse to a new colony. So the new queen, the daughter queen, will take a proportion of her mother's workers with her off to form a new colony. Now, why do we focus on this haplodiploidy? Here's why. If we have our haploid drone mating with a diploid queen, the worker offspring are also diploid, okay? And so his only offspring in the colony are daughters. He can't have any sons because the sons are the haploid eggs of the wife, okay? Now in the next generation, the new drone will mate with a particular individual and the whole cycle repeats, okay? So what we want to do is to focus on this reproductive female here. She has sisters. She has brothers. She'll eventually mate with another husband. She'll have daughters. She'll have sons, okay? Now, because of haplodiploidy, the amazing thing is she's incredibly closely related to her sisters because the sperm that comprised half of her genome are essentially clones. They're genetically identical. The male can only produce one genotype in his sperm, and they're transferred intact to the next generation. So she's 100% related through her father's lineage to her sisters, and she's still related to her other half through her mother's offspring by a quarter. So she's related to her sister by three quarters. Now, whereas the female is related to her sisters by three-fourths, she's still going to have haploid gametes to produce her daughters, haploid gametes to produce sons. She herself is a result of a haploid egg and a haploid sperm. So she has the more normal relationships between herself and her parent and her offspring. This peculiar high degree of relatedness is only between sisters. So haploid diploidy results in a very peculiar pattern of genetic kinship. Sisters are related to each other by three-fourths. Mothers are related to their daughters only by a half. And sisters and brothers are only related to each other by a quarter. So in that hive where you have those sterile workers, those workers are helping their mother to produce more sisters. Sisters are more closely related to each other than to anyone else in the hive, and they're even more closely related to their sisters to their, than they are to their own offspring. So given this really high degree of kinship, it's relatively easy for this inequality to be met. So Hamilton's rule would definitely tell us that we should see a lot more cooperation between haplodiploid sisters than anybody else. So haplodiploidy predisposes ants and bees to eusociality because of that extremely close genetic relationship between sisters.